For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch for him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready, and with all of a beautiful countenance and godly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came forward upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Today and this evening, we're looking for people after God's own heart. Let's pray. Father, as we contemplate on your word, bless and watch over us and speak to our hearts. Purify our hearts. Make our hearts resemble your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we live in a world of modern technology. Recently I was reading about a device, a technolo technological gadget used by law enforcement. It is called an ALPR. It stands for an automated license place reader. If you look at a, at a police cruiser, of the Minneapolis police or the uh, Brooklyn Central Police or uh, Minnesota State Police, you'll see that they have a little black box either on the roof or on the hood or on the trunk. This is an automated license plate reader. As the officer drives the cruiser, this little machine can read hundreds of license plates per minute and processes the information. And if it captures the license plate of a scofflaw or someone with a warrant or a stolen vehicle, the APLR locks on that plate and the alarm goes off letting the officer know that he should begin the pursuit. I want you to know tonight that God has an AHR, an automated heart reader. The Bible tells me that God is always scanning this community, this church, looking for people whose hearts uh, resemble him. I'm not making this up. If you turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9, you find the AHR. 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9 tells us, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. This is why when, when God is reading hearts in Israel, he realizes that Saul can no longer be king. And so he's looking for a man after his own heart. His eyes are looking to and fro throughout Israel for a king whose heart is perfect toward him. And as he scanned the kingdom of Israel, his AHR locked in on David's heart. And God shouted for joy, I have found me a man after my own heart. And so he sends Samuel. He sends Samuel to look for this king. He sends Samuel to sanctify Jesse 
in his sons, sanctification was required before any religious service. The Bible tells us, sanctify yourselves and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And Joshua said to the people, Joshua 3, 5, sanctify yourselves so tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Samuel goes to Jesse's house. Before doing that, he asks the elders to sanctify themselves. Then he sanctifies uh, Jesse's sons. And this teaches us that before performing any religious function, we ought to prepare ourselves through sanctification. Before you preach a sermon, before you lead out in communion, before you come to church to worship, you need to make sure that things are right with God. Pray and confess your sins. Ask God to cleanse you by his grace. The sanctification process has taken place. And now it is time to focus on finding a new king. God doesn't give Samuel specific instructions. God could have told Samuel explicitly who he wanted, but he didn't in this case. This is a rare moment in which Samuel was somewhat unsure of the task before him. If you recall, when it was time to choose a king, God specifically told Samuel uh, who to look for. Tomorrow at this time, behold, the man who's, who's head and shoulders above everybody else, that's going to be your king. But this time, God doesn't give any specific instructions. All Samuel knew is that he was looking for a man after God's own heart. God gave him general directions. And Samuel had to follow by faith. He did not know who would be anointed. He just needed to follow the Spirit's lead. And today we need to let ourselves be led by God and follow the steps that he instructs us to follow. Sometimes you want to tell God what to do. Sometimes we would want to outline, God, you got to do it this way and enumerate the steps he has to follow. Some of us think we can boss God or get the ground, but sometimes it's best just to let God lead. He does a much better job than we do. So it's time now to look at Jesse's sons. You remember Jesse? He's the son of Obed, who is the son of Boaz, who is the, uh, and Ruth, the Moabitess. You remember Ruth. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. That tells me that God is an equal opportunity God. He's not restrained by social customs or prejudices or traditions or protocols. He's not limited by caste system or racism or sexism or nationalism. He chooses whoever he wants. So when it comes time to select a king, he visits the house of an immigrant's grandson. And he does not stop there because nine generations later, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah, the king of kings and lords of lords will come from the same lineage. And so the selection process begins. Jesse calls his first son, Eliab. His name means of whom God is father. And he looked on Eliab and said, wow. Eliab was tall, handsome, impressive. His, his, his appearance commanded respect whenever he walked into a room. He kind of reminded Samuel of a young King Saul, a tall, stately young man. And this was the standard that was used when Saul was selected as king. He stood taller than everybody else. Matthew Henry says it was strange that Samuel, who had been so disappointed in Saul, whose countenance and stature recommended him, should, ju should judge another man by that rule. We can tell how men look on the outside, but only God can tell what they are on the inside. Samuel is immediately so impressed with Eliab's dignity that he is ready to uncork the horn of oil and pour it on Eliab's head. He was mistaken, however, in acting too quickly before hearing what God had to say. Samuel concluded, the Lord's anointed is before him. The Lord didn't say that. Samuel did. If you're before God, you got to let God speak. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. God says, Samuel, not so fast. 
the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. The Lord sees not what man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God tells Samuel, hold on, prophet. You're using the wrong standard. He was also applying the, uh, the wrong standard, using an outdated job description. He needed somebody in HR to help him restructure the job qualification. The day was gone where you could pick somebody based on how tall or how short they were. What standards are you using and selecting people for whatever? What standard are you using to select people for leadership in your church? What do you look for when, in people when you're asked to serve on the nominating committee? What do you look for in selecting a spouse? Is your company hiring? Using the wrong standards can have catastrophic effects in your life. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God said of Eliab, I have refused him. And if you want to know why God refused Eliab, you just need to look at the next chapter in the Bible. Eliab, as tall as he was for all his good looks, did nothing for 40 days while a petulant giant insulted the name of God before Israel. Later on, David, the little brother, would arrive on the scene and was offended by God. And his reaction was, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And instead of hearing the righteous indignation and wisdom emanating from his little brother, Eliab rebuked David and tells him, go back home where you belong. You're just a busybody. You're looking for gossip. The Message Bible records the conversation this way. Eliab, his older brother, heard David fraternizing with the man and lost his temper. What are you doing here? Why aren't you minding your own business, tending that scrawny flock of sheep? I know what you're up to. You've come down here to see the sights and hoping for a ringside seat at the battle. So can you see why, if God is searching for a man after his own heart, he would not be impressed with Eliab? Next comes Abinadab, the father of nobleness, his name means. His nobleness never shone through because he too was on the battlefield when, with Saul when Goliath challenged and threw down the gauntlets. He chose to remain in anonymity. He was just there and did nothing to distinguish himself. It's probable that he was present when Eliab bereaved David and, and said nothing. God looked at Abinadab and said, uh-uh, it ain't him. Next came Shema, a name meaning desolation. He was too with Eliab and Abinadab in battle, but like them, he failed to distinguish himself. And so Samuel told Jesse, next. And the same scene is repeated four more times with Jesse's remaining sons. God rejected all of them. And this seems bizarre to Samuel because God has unequivocally stated that one of Jesse's sons is to be king. And reaching this point with no king anointed means either I missed the signal when the chosen one was selected or there must be a son that is unaccounted for. I don't think I missed the signal because in each case, I heard God rejecting them. And so Samuel confronts Jesse with the obvious question. Are you sure these are all your sons? Samuel knew what question to ask because he trusted God's word. He could have said maybe God was mistaken. Or perhaps we should do it all over again and make the seven of them come through. But he understands instinctively that not all of Jesse's sons have been presented to him. And so Jesse's answer seems simple, but it's complicated. It shows how the entire family really feels about David. Jesse said, well, this, they, they remained at the youngest. 
and behold, he keepeth the sheep. There are three things we should note about this answer. Number one, David is thought to be so insignificant that his father does not even mention his name. He just calls him the youngest one. Number two, nobody thought that David was worthy enough to be invited to the feast. And number three, David would have never been called unless the prophet had insisted on getting him there. So small was David in his father's esteem that it wasn't even considered necessary to include him in the family when the prophet called the family to sacrifice. When we consider that David was the youngest of eight sons, we aren't surprised at how low uh, regard he had in his own family. And it wasn't because David's character or conduct was unworthy. It was simply because he was the youngest of eight sons. And so Samuel said, fetch him. We will not eat, we will not have dinner, nothing happens until he comes. It's interesting that the text focuses for a moment on David's outward appearance. When the essence of the passage that we read is that God's not interested in outward appearance. He looks on the inside. The text says that he was ready. This means either his hair or his skin was reddish. His skin tone may have something to do with being out in the sun and tending to the sheep. The text does say he was attractive and handsome, not perhaps as good looking as his elder brothers, but remember God was looking for inner beauty. In rejecting Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 28, God had told Samuel, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours, to Saul, who is better than you. As unlikely as he appeared, David was better than Saul in the eyes of God. They wait for David to arrive, and the moment he walks in, into the room, the Lord said, Arise! Anoint him! It is he! God chooses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. He chooses a shepherd to be a king, as he chose a carpenter to be the Messiah. Don't worry about puffing up yourself. Don't worry about making yourself important. Don't worry about jostling for position or politicking for influence. If you want to rise, be humble. Open your heart to God. And this is how God works. He elevates the humble. Psalms 113, 7 and 8 tells us, He raises the poor out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with the princes, even the princes of his people. Isaiah puts it this way, every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And so when God gives a command, Samuel takes the horn, anoints David in the midst of his brethren. Notice at the beginning we said that the ceremony required sanctification. Samuel had made the elders sanctify themselves. Samuel made Jesse's sons sanctify themselves. But when David walks in, nobody sanctifies David. Samuel just pours the oil in his head. Why doesn't Samuel sanctify David? It's because David was already sanctified through his daily walk with God. David walked so close with God that God had already sanctified him. That is why God chose him in the first place. David walked in, and Samuel saw sanctification written all over his face. He concluded, God has already sanctified him. I don't need to. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Samuel poured the oil on David's head and prayed that God would accomplish his purpose in David's life. David was anointed and spent years getting spiritual training before becoming the theocratic king that God desired. And the spirit of the Lord came on David from that day forward. The unction for the function includes consensual presence of God's Holy Spirit. You can't function without the spirit of God in your life. The oil was symbolic of the Spirit of God being on David. 
with the son of David, the Messiah, it was the dove that appeared at his head at the baptism. With the disciples, it was the tongue of fire. There cannot be an anointing without the manifestation of the Spirit of God in your life. The Bible said of Daniel that he was blessed and favored because there was an excellent spirit in him. God promises, and it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old man shall dream dreams and your young man shall see visions. I pray that God will bless you and endow you with his perpetual presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. God is looking for people whose heart is perfect towards him. We must have hearts like God's heart. David was chosen because Man looked on the outside, but God looked on the inside. Man looks at outward appearance, God looks on the heart. God chose David because he could see his heart. Modern medical technology allows us to go deep into the human body. We have x-ray machines and MRIs and CAT scans and to peer into the minutiae of the human anatomy. But God doesn't need gadgetry. He searches us and knows our hearts. He tries us and knows our thoughts. When he searched for David, he liked what he saw. And that is why when he announces God's rejection of Saul to the king, he states, the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the captain of his people. Even in the New Testament, Paul writes in Acts 13, verse 22, and when he had removed them, he raised unto them David to be their king, to whom he also gave their testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. God looked at David's heart and it brought him joy. My invitation to you today is to stop living to please man and start living to please God. God is still looking for people after his own heart. God has a scanner looking at your heart, my heart, our hearts, everybody's heart. Eugene Patterson writes, David was chosen not for what anybody saw in him, not his father, his brothers, not even Samuel, but because of what God saw in him. What God saw in David was a passion for God. What saw, God saw in David was purity and integrity and love for God. God said, I can work with this brother. What does God see when he scans your heart? If you want to have a heart like David's heart, have the passion for God that David had for God. Live the life that David and, uh, and, and pray the prayers that David prayed. Let's look at some of those prayers. Psalm 27. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee. What my heart said unto thee? Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Or in Psalms 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 84. My soul longeth, yea, even painteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Psalms 119. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And Psalms 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, after contemplating the prayers that David prayed, can you understand why, why this man would cause alarm bells to go off in God's automatic heart scanner? My appeal to you is that you will dedicate your heart to the Lord like never before. 
and when his eyes are running to and fro, seeking whom to anoint, when he scans you, he will find a human soul whose heart is perfect towards him. When you do, he will look in you and find his glory reflected in you. May you become a man or a woman after God's own heart, so that when God visits Kenyan Community Church, his, and his eyes run to and fro, he may find that, that, that he wants to anoint you. The beauty of all the, of this is that man scans because he wants to punish, right? The police scanner is looking for scoff laws to punish, but God is looking for good people to reward. He can celebrate you like he celebrated David. My prayer is that when God scans Kenyan Community Church, alarm bells will go off in his heart. Look over there, a, a, a man after my own heart. Look back there, a, a woman after my own heart, or a young person whose heart is perfect. Wow. Tonight we know man looks at the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. Man looks at your heights. But God looks at your heart. Man looks at your outside. But God looks on your inside. Man looks at the color of your skin. But God looks at the color of your heart. Man looks at where you were born. God is looking to see if you've been born again. Man looks where you live. God looks who lives in you. Man looks at what you drive, but God looks at what drives you. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside. Man looks at your popularity. God looks at your sanctification. Man looks at everything on the outside. Man looks to see if you have the eloquence to, to talk the talk. God looks if you have the uh, semblance to walk the walk. Man looks at the outside. What does God see when he looks at you? God's eyes are running to and fro, searching for men and women, for young people whose heart is perfect towards him. I pray that when he conducts a scan on you, may his eyes lock on your heart, because man looks at the outside, but God can read your heart.